Good to see you. So tonight we'll continue our uh, study of Marita, Sri Upadesha Marita, the nectar of instruction. <laughs> tonight we'll cover verses six and seven from the nectar of instruction. Now, the so far we've covered things that we should do and the things that we should not do so far. Uh, the nivriti, nivriti means things to be avoided. Pravriti means the things which are favorable in devotional service. So we're, we're covering both. So <clears throat> the first two verses are things that we must avoid in devotional service if we want to become successful. We have to uh, avoid the urges, the six urges, uh, which are unfavorable uh, if they're not controlled to perform devotional service. And then we have to avoid the six obstacles, which will destroy our bhakti. Then uh, from verses 3 to 7, we hear about the positive things, <clears throat> things that are favorable, poverty. Or things that are favorable to our devotional service. So we hear about uh, the six things which are favorable for devotional service, and then the six loving exchanges uh, between the devotees. Uh, and then last week we also covered uh, verse number five, in which we understood the different types of devotees or the different levels of devotees, the Uttama Adhikari the Kanishta Adhikari, the Majjama Adhikari, the three different types of devotees, so that we can differentiate, so that we know how to uh, associate with others uh, according to their level of advancement and our level of advancement. In relationships, this is an, this is an important point to understand <coughs> based on the nectar of instruction. If there is ever friction uh, in any relationship in the material world, whether it's uh, a devotional relationship or otherwise. If we feel that there's some friction in the relationship, that means that one member in the relationship or both do not understand their position in relationship to the other person. In other words, sometimes someone is junior to us, sometimes someone is senior to us, or sometimes they are equal. And if there is a friction in the relationship, it means we don't understand uh, the dynamic of the relationship. Uh, it means that we are acting outside of the correct dynamic in that particular circumstance. And that causes friction in the relationships. So tonight, we're going to go through verses 6 and 7, which are two very powerful verses. Uh, Rupa Goswami has listed in the Upadesha Marita, he's, he's chosen 11 verses, which takes us from the beginning of spiritual life to the highest levels of spiritual life. So these six, ver these 11 verses, they take us from the beginning to the highest level. So each verse uh, is a very terse, uh, compact, and powerful presentation of particular points in Krishna consciousness. So tonight, verses six and seven is powerful as the previous five verses have been. So we'll read through. And if you have any questions or any comments as we go, then please, please ask. Verse number six. Drishtvai swabhava janitair vapushash chedoshair na prakrita twam iha bhakta janasya pashyat Gangam basam na kalu bubuda fena pankair Brahma drava twam apa gachati nirda damai. <clears throat> Translation Being situated in his original Krishna conscious position, a pure devotee does not identify with the body. Such a devotee should not be seen from a materialistic point of view. 
Indeed, one should overlook a devotee's having a body born in a low family, a body with a bad complexion, a deformed body, or a diseased or infirm body. According to ordinary vision, such imperfections may seem prominent in the body of a pure devotee, but despite such seeming defects, the body of a pure devotee cannot be polluted. It is exactly like the waters of the Ganges, which sometimes during the rainy season are full of bubbles, foam and mud. The Ganges waters do not become polluted. Those who are advanced in spiritual understanding will bathe in the Ganges without considering the condition of the water. So this verse is very important because Rupa Goswami is pointing out to us that we should avoid Vaishnava Parad, Sadhu Ninda. This is one of the 10 offenses in chanting the holy name of Krishna. Uh, it's called Sadhu Ninda. Sadhu Ninda means uh, to offend devotees, to commit offenses, Vaishnava Parad. Now, when we chant the 10 offenses in the morning against the holy name. So, so when we chant the 10 offenses in the morning against the holy name, eight of those offenses, which is number two and then four to 10, they are overcome by uh, knowledge. When we have correct Divya Jnana or correct knowledge, correct spiritual understanding, we won't commit those offenses. Uh, versus, uh, sorry, offense number one and number three, they are overcome by approaching the person that you have offended. The first offense is to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to propagating the holy name of the Lord. And the third offense is to disobey the orders of the spiritual master. Now, if we disobey the orders of the spiritual master, we have to go to the spiritual master and pray for forgiveness. If we blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to propagating the holy name of the Lord, we have to go to the devotees and beg their forgiveness. So these are the ways that we overcome this offense. You have to directly go to the personality and beg forgiveness for any offense. And generally, the, those personalities will forgive you because the nature of the devotee is to be compassionate. Uh, so, we may uh, sometimes commit these offenses towards the devotees or to the spiritual master, but they can be overcome. Now, the first offense is to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to propagating the holy name of the Lord. The third offense is to disobey the orders of the spiritual master. These two offenses are directly connected. How are they directly connected? Because if you blaspheme devotees and you repeatedly and willingly offend other devotees of Krishna, Krishna will withdraw his reciprocation with you. You will lose your taste or enthusiasm for performing devotional service. And then you will be, you will find it difficult to uh, follow the orders of the spiritual master, and then you'll disobey the orders of the guru. Similarly, if you disobey the orders of the guru, uh, Krishna will also withdraw his reciprocation with you. You'll lose your taste, and then you begin to criticize other devotees. So we see both of these things, they take place. Now, they're, they're reciprocal. These two uh, offenses are directly connected. So it is being emphasized here, don't see devotees from a material point of view. This is elaborated upon uh, in the Harinam Chintamani, where Haridas Thakur and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are speaking to each other. And uh, Haridas Thakur, he explains in the Harinam Chintamani that 
We should not see the devotee from a materialistic point of view. He says that is an offense. The Harinam Chintamani is an elaboration or an, an, an analysis of the 10 offenses uh, that we can commit while chanting the holy name of Krishna. So it's an important book to study. And he says in that, uh, in, in the Harinam Chintamani, in the teachings, he says that we should never see devotees according to their material position. In other words, it's offensive to categorize a devotee because of his material situation. In other words, if you say, well, uh, this devotee is Russian, or this devotee is Indian, or this devotee is Sri Lankan, or from Mauritius, or from Australia, or from Tasmania, or from anywhere. And if you uh, are, are a racist person due to your material contamination, and you blaspheme the devotee or mistreat the devotee according to some material calculation in your mind, you've committed an offense to the devotee. Similarly, if the devotee has a deformed body or has some material defect, and you Criticize the devotee because of that, that's also an offense. Uh, Srila Prabhupada wore glasses, you know, because, uh, you know, to read and so forth, Prabhupada needed glasses, as I do now, as many of us do. So one devotee said something to Prabhupada or inferred that, you know, Prabhupada, if you're a pure devotee, why do you need glasses? So this is materialistic vision. <laughs> and sometimes Prabhupada would give class and he would forget a shloka in the class. And he would say, what is that? Uh, what is that verse? And some devotees, they said to Prabhupada, they said, well, Prabhupada, if you're a pure devotee, how can you forget? And Prabhupada said, this is material vision. This is not spiritual vision. <laughs> this is material vision. So if we criticize a devotee because of his or her material defects or race, actually, uh, Haridas Thakur says that if you criticize a devotee because of actions or behavior that they performed before they became a devotee, that's also an offense. You know, you say, oh, well, you know, they used to do this. They used to act like this. That's an offense. Oh, they used to do, they used to steal. Oh, they used to uh, do not very good things. Gambling and uh, drinking and womanizing, so many things. Right? That's, that's an offense. If we say, oh, the devotee used it, well, he's not doing it now. So we don't blaspheme the devotee based on previous conduct, or previous bad behavior. So these different uh, <clears throat> points are made by Haridas Thakur. He also says that we should not blaspheme a devotee or judge a devotee according to Varna and Ashram. Oh, that devotee is a Grihasta. And the, the Brahmacharis and the Sannyasis may say, oh, the Grihastas are fallen. Or vice versa, you know, the uh, Grihasas will say, oh, the sannyasis are all false. Or, you know, this is blasphemy. It's all based on material things. Uh, or the Brahmanas, you know, sometimes I've heard devotees say, I am a Brahmana. <laughs> and they get a superiority complex and they offend other devotees. Oh, we are better. And, oh, they're the Shudras or the Chatriyas or the Vaishyas or whatever they you know, this is also an offense. You have to be very careful. It's... So Haridas Thakur says, be very careful. Harinam Shintam. So you have to be very careful about offending other devotees. Actually, there are six ways that you can offend a devotee. There are six different ways. Uh, and they go from very 
uh, not so serious ways that you could offend a devotee, up to very serious <laughs> ways that you can have <laughs> six levels of offense. Uh, I think it, it's in one of the Puranas. Uh, I'm trying to think. I just can't remember right now exactly which Purana it's from, but I'll, I'll give you the list. So, the, 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 the least serious is not to be happy when you see a devotee. If you see a devotee and you're not happy and you don't greet them nicely, that's an offense because the devotee may feel, oh, you know, this devotee has not uh, greeted me nicely. I remember one time I was in India. I came back after a month and I met one devotee and he was not, he was very indifferent to me. And I actually felt, because I hadn't seen him for a month, I actually felt a little hurt. You know, so this is an, it's a very slight offense. You know, so we have to be very careful. If you don't smile when you see a devotee, right? It's a very slight offense. If the devotee feels hurt or uh, upset, it's a very slight offense. Secondly, to be angry at a devotee. Sometimes we have to be angry with devotees. If, if you're a senior devotee and you have to correct a junior devotee, sometimes you have to be angry, but only in that circumstance. But if you're angry with a devotee unnecessarily, that's an offense to the devotee. Number four, uh, the, the third one, yeah, not to glorify a devotee. It actually says in the Shastra, it is mentioned that one should not fail to glorify the spiritual master. You know, if there's an opportunity to glorify the guru and you don't, it's a, it's a breach of etiquette. So if you don't glorify a devotee when there's an obvious reason to glorify a devotee and that devotee feels a little hurt, oh, you know, I wasn't recognized, you know, that my, my friend did not recognize me for this service or, then that is an, an offense. Being envious of a devotee, that's number four. You know, and uh, uh, how do how does envy manifest through our words and our deeds? You know, sometimes we say not very nice things. You know, verse two said, "Don't speak prajalpa. Don't speak unnecessary topics." And quite often devotees do this. They get together and they say, "Oh, that devotee," and you know, they're negative and they they criticize. Oh, you know, and they, they say, oh, that devotee, they've been like that, and they've done this. Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, who is one of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, he would not hear or listen to uh, criticism of other Vaishnavas, even if it was true. Even if it was true, he wouldn't listen. So anyway, everyone has faults, and he would just walk off and continue with his devotional service. So we should also learn not to Envy, criticized words. Uh, number five, don't blaspheme devotees. You might feel envious, but then if you actually start saying negative things about devotees, it can become very detrimental to your bhakti, to your devotional service. And the final offense is to kill a devotee. That's the most serious, obviously, that's the most serious. Of the uh, of the offenses by the Vaishnava Aparats. So I don't think any of us will ever do that. It's very serious, very serious offense. You know, you would you would suffer for a long time for committing that offense. And it says Tulsi by Circuit Tulsi. Circuit Ambulate. It would take time. It would take time. It does happen, but it would take time. So, be very careful about offending devotees. <laughs> okay, so, uh, oh, sh uh, I've got people WhatsApping me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so in the purple, Prabhupada says on page 60. One who engages in full devotional service, who does not fall down in any circumstance, 
At one transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. So one time, uh, actually Tamal Krishna said to Prabhupada in 1968, not long after he joined the movement, he said to Prabhupada, how many pure devotees are there on the planet? Srila Prabhupada said, how many, pure, how many devotees are there in ISKCON? And back then there was about 80. Prabhupada said they are pure devotees. And Prabhupada gave the example of a mango. And he said, just like a mango can be ripe or unripe, it is still beneficial. Because green mango, you make green mango chutney, which is delicious. And then there's ripe mango, you take the mango and you honor it, uh, prasadam, which has been offered to you. So ripe or unripe, both are good. Yeah, both have merit, both have value. So it means that uh, a devotee will become a pure devotee in due course of time if he just follows the process of devotional service. So therefore we should not criticize devotees because they're doing their best. Of course, if you're a senior devotee, it is your duty to point out the faults of the junior devotees. Otherwise they don't improve. It's, it's not a, a my guru Maharaj, the last Australian in, when was it? 2000 or 2001, yeah, maybe beginning of 2001. The uh, last time he came to Australia, he actually made this point in one of our darshans in Sydney. He said, from now on, I just want to have sweet dealings with devotees. He said, for so many years, I've had to chastise and correct everyone. And, and because he was the most senior devotee in ISKCON, he had to, and he said, I just want to have sweet dealings from now on. Now, I don't want, that was after his cancer. He, he didn't have the energy. He didn't want to have to uh, correct everyone all the time. So if you're a senior devotee, it's actually your service to correct. And it's not easy. It's not pleasant. But you have to do it. And if you don't do it, you're But for everyone else, don't blaspheme the devotees. Don't criticize the devotees. You only criticize if it's your position to criticize. Otherwise, don't criticize the devotees. Uh, so, on page 61, Prabhupada says, Krishna's devotees, sorry, Krishna's devotee is not subjected to material condition. Even though his bodily features may appear materially conditioned, one should therefore not see a pure devotee from a materialistic point of view. Unless one is actually a devotee, he cannot see another devotee perfectly. So, you know, we don't see devotees according to their material position. But we offer respect to them uh, based on their divya gyan, based on their knowledge. Devotion to Krishna. Uh, the bottom of 61. As the bodily defects of a pure devotee, if there are such defects, they should be overlooked. What should be taken into account is the spiritual master's main business, which is a, which is devotional service, pure service to the Supreme Lord. Then on page 62, near the bottom of the first paragraph, Prabhupada says, a devotee is not controlled by the senses, but is the controller of the senses. Consequently, he should be called Swami or Goswami even though he may not be born in a Goswami family. <clears throat> this word Goswami means one who controls the senses, a master of the senses. Now, uh, Srila Prabhupada instructed us, the reason that we bow down to Sanya is because they have conquered sex desire. Uh, they have controlled their senses. They go swamis. That's why we bow down to them. Uh, I was actually listening to His Holiness Shiva Ram Swami speak recently, and he actually said it was a concern for him 
that this etiquette of bowing down to sannyasis is not being followed very well in our movement at this point in time. He said that whenever he walks through Mayapur, you know, he said only five to 10% of the devotees he passes actually bow down. You know, most devotees just nod or they just kind of pranam. And he said, it's actually not the etiquette. And he said, he's actually concerned that we will lose these etiquettes over time. And we're meant to preserve our Vaishnav culture. It actually says uh, in the Vedas that if you see a sannyasi and you do not bow down, your pious merits are destroyed. So therefore we need to offer respect to any devotee, but especially to very advanced devotees like sannyasis and gurus and so forth. Even when they are offering their obeisances to the king certain circumstances where yeah. if they're doing something you don't, yeah. but in any other circumstance you should do it. Uh, near the bottom of 62, Prabhupada says, whether the devotees come from a family of previous acharyas or from an ordinary family, they should be treated equally. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and it says the six Goswamis, they were dear to the ruffians and the gentlemen. In other words, we should treat people equally. We should offer respect to everyone, regardless of their material circumstances. Uh, page 63, Prabhupada said, this Krishna consciousness movement is tra a transcendental science and there is no room for jealousy. The movement is meant for the Paramahamsas who are completely free from all jealousy. Uh, I remember Sanyasi was making an observation a few years ago. He said to me that in our movement, probably our most famous temple in our movement is the Chalpati Temple, uh, which is under the direction of his holding. Now, Radhanath Swami, he places great emphasis on Vaishnav Seva, serving devotees. And uh, this sannyasi was... The reason that temple is so successful is because uh, Vaishnava Parad is not being committed. Because there's so much emphasis on glorification of devotees and serving devotees and not criticizing devotees and offending devotees. There are so, much, so many blessings and so much success, which is within that, uh, that temple. So we should all follow that example. Uh, then at the bottom of 63, Prabhupada says, if we consider the bodily defects of a Vaishnava, we should understand that we are committing an offense at the lotus feet of the Vaishnava. An offense at the lotus feet of a Vaishnava is very serious. Indeed, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has described this offense as Hati Mata, the mad elephant offense. So you might have a nice garden, like some of our friends, they have nice gardens. <laughs> but if a mad elephant or one of the cows or a mad bull comes into your, uh, into your garden, they can destroy everything. So if you offend the devotees, this is like the Hati Mata, it's a mad elephant offense because you're trying to advance in Krishna consciousness and your Bhakti Lata, your creeper of devotion, the devotion of Krishna is growing like a, a creeper, like a plant. And then if you, while you're making advancement, even if you become very advanced, if you commit offenses to devotees, it's like an elephant coming in and just crushing your creeper. And then it's very difficult to advance in your Krishna consciousness. So we have to be very careful about committing offenses to the devotees. Page 64, Prabhupada says, one should therefore avoid observing a pure devotee externally, but should try to see the internal features and understand how they are engaged in transcendental loving service of the Lord. 
In this way, one can avoid seeing the pure devotee from a material point of view, and thus one can gradually become purif a purified devotee himself. Hmm. So, Prabhupada is emphasizing, be very careful about committing offenses to the devotees. Otherwise, it will ruin our spiritual life. Does anyone have any points at this point? Okay, so now we will discuss verse number seven, which is also extremely important, extremely famous. Uh, so we will have a look at the, this verse. Shat Krishna Nama Charitadi Sita Yavidya Pito Patapta Rasanasya Narochikanu Kin Kintwadarad Anudinam Kalu Saiva Jushta Swadvi Kramad Bhavati Tad Yadamula Hantri. <clears throat> Translation. The holy name, character, pastimes, and activities of Krishna are all transcendentally sweet like sugar candy. Although the tongue of one afflicted by jaundice, the jaundice of Avidya, ignorance, cannot taste anything sweet. It is wonderful that simply by carefully chanting these sweet names every day, a natural relish awakens within his tongue, and his disease is gradually destroyed at the root. So this is a very famous and very important verse in our philosophy because it focuses on uh, the Yuga Dharma. Uh, Kali Kali Nama Rupi Krishna Avatar. In the age of Kali, the incarnation of Krishna is the holy name of Krishna. Therefore, we have to learn the holy name. Uh, sometimes in the Shastra, uh, the holy name is called Harinam Prabhu. Harinam Prabhu means the personality of the holy name. Who is Krishna himself. We need to learn to cultivate a relationship with the holy name. You know, I was very fortunate uh, about a month ago, I was at a holy name retreat. And I've done this for the last 20 years. I go to a holy name retreats run by His Grace Burujan Prabhu and Mother Jagatarini and His Holiness Sachinandan Swami and others. And these, these advanced devotees, these purified devotees, Any devotees, they like on this where devotees they take extra time to go and chant the holy name. And Sachinandan Swami, in one of the retreats a number of years ago, I remember he gave a very nice example. He said, just like sometimes in marriage, marriage is one of the most important relationships in our life, if not the most important, uh, besides the relationship with the Guru and with Krishna and the Vaishnavas and Tulsi and Prasadam. And, you know, you get the point. So, Children, yeah. So uh, that relationship of marriage for it can become uh, 
difficult one to overcome is to spend quality time, extra time together, to go away and to spend time together, and then sometimes that can rejuvenate the relationship. So similarly, such an Anand Swami said, sometimes with the holy holy name, right? Because we're not being attentive, we're not giving quality time to the holy name. So therefore, uh, Maharaj was pointing out that sometimes we need to go away and just spend extra time with the holy name to chant, increase our chanting and spend quality time with the holy name and rejuvenate the relationship. So many devotees do this in order to uh, their relationship with the holy name. Now, as the verse says, just like when you have jaundice, a liver disease, you, when you taste sweet things, they taste bitter. You, know, you may have experienced that. Sometimes you taste something sweet and it tastes bitter. This means that your liver is not working properly. So then in the Ayurveda, it says one of the Cures for your is to eat sugar candy, right? Pure sugar. And that will cure the disease, cure the liver, and regenerate. So that, and you know that you're getting better over time when the sweet things begin to taste sweet again. Because when, you, when you're sick, sweet things taste bitter. But the more you, and you take the sweet things, as the cure, and over time, uh, you begin to taste the sweetness again. That means you are rejuvenating yourself. You're recovering. So in this verse, it, it is described that if we want to cure ourselves of the lack of taste, the lack of nam ruchi, or the lack of taste that we have for hearing and chanting about Krishna, then the cure is to increase our hearing and chanting about Krishna. And by doing that, then our taste uh, develops. Our disease, our avidya, or our material ignorance, it begins to dissipate and we develop a taste for hearing and chanting about Krishna. So, uh, we'll look in the, the purport. Prabhupada says on page 67, if one with great care and attention takes to Krishna consciousness, chanting the holy name and hearing Krishna's transcendental pastimes, his ignorance will be destroyed and his tongue enabled to taste the sweetness of the transcendental nature of Krishna and his paraphernalia. Such a recovery of spiritual health is possible only by the regular cultivation of Krishna consciousness. So Rupa Goswami actually writes in another place, he says that, why do I just have one tongue and two ears? One tongue and two ears is not enough to taste all the sweetness that is contained within the two syllables, Krishna. So, he said, there is so much sweetness within the two syllables Krishna that I wish I had millions of tongues and millions of ears so that I could taste all the sweetness that is within the holy name of Krishna. So, uh, by chanting, we will develop this Nama Ruchi, this Vasudev Kata Ruchi this taste for hearing and chanting about Krishna. Uh, at the bottom of page 67, Prabhupada says, the normal condition is to remain an eternal servant of the Lord. Jivera Srupahoy Krishnera Nitsh this condition 
is lost when the living entity forgets Krishna due to being attracted to the external features of Krishna's Maya energy. So this is our problem. We have uh, become attached to Maya. And what is the definition of the, or the translation of the word Maya? That which is not. It is illusion. The Maya is so powerful. Mama Maya Dirachaya, Krishna says within the Bhagavad Gita, that the Maya, the external energy, the material energy, is his energy, Mama Maya. It is created by Krishna. So therefore, uh, because Krishna is Maheshwara, the greatest magician, his illusion is so powerful, it can bewilder the conditioned souls. And we forget our eternal relationship with Krishna. And so this is... This is the power of Maya. And we have become attracted and attached to Maya. One time, a new Vrindavan, uh, Prabhupada's Fiasa Puja, Prabhupada was asked by a, a, new, a, new, a newcomer. He said, why is Maya so powerful? Which is a very good question. Sometimes we ask this ourselves. Why is Maya so powerful? Prabhupada said, Maya is not powerful. You are not sincere. In other words, if we are truly devoted to Krishna, we'll give up our attachment to the material energy. But if we're not truly devoted to Krishna, then we will not be attracted to Krishna. We will, we will remain attached to the material energy, which is very alluring, very powerful. Uh, page 68, Srila Prabhupada says at the top, the Krishna consciousness movement is being spread over the world, all over the world, just to remedy this gross ignorance. So that is the purpose of ISKCON. Right? That's the purpose of the Hare Krishna movement, to purify people, to teach them the process, the sadhana, for them to overcome their material desires and attachments. Uh, the top of page 69, very bottom of 68, Prabhupada says, similarly, the present confused state of humanity, in the present confused state of humanity, Krishna consciousness, the chanting of the holy name of the Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Is the only remedy for setting the world aright. Although Krishna consciousness may not be very palatable for a diseased person, Srila Rupa Goswami nonetheless advises that if one wants to be cured of the material disease, he must take to it with great care and attention. It was interesting because our good friend Prana Prabhu a few days ago in Vrindavan uh, wrote a, uh, his five times, his five hours. And Dai Mataji, who was a who is a disciple Prabhupada who lives in Vrindavan for many years. Her advice was uh, to Pranapuru and to Chandakoti and to any of us who are leaving our body. Uh, she said, just take shelter of the holy name. Just take shelter of the holy name. And that's what Pranapuru did. Chanted the holy name of Krishna. Because Nama Chintamani Krishna, Chaitanya Rasa Vigra, who know. Shudo Nichibukdo Abhinitanamanamano. This famous verse about the holy name says that Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasa Vigra. The holy name is Chintamani. Chintamani means it is thought conscious. Uh, 
Uh, it can fulfill all of our desires, all of our spiritual desires, even our material desires, but we don't want to concentrate on them. But our fulfilled by chanting the holy name of Krishna. That, that our swaru, our spiritual form, our eternal relationship with Krishna, will be revealed to us while chanting the holy name. So while chanting the holy name within our heart, the spiritual master will reveal uh, our Name is Chintara Rasa Vigraha. It is the form of Rasa. Rasa means pleasure. Uh, it is Krishna Himself. Therefore, we should take shelter of the Holy Bhakti no Tarakur term the phrase Namashraya. Namashraya means taking shelter of the Holy Name. That is our methodology to become purified. Uh, halfway down page 69, Prabhupada says, the real disease in the heart, sorry, the real disease is in the heart. If the mind is cleansed, however, if consciousness is cleansed, a person cannot be armed by the material disease to cleanse the mind and heart from one should take to this chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So in the Bhagavatam in the 10th canto in the chapter uh, describing the Rasa Leela it actually says the greatest enemy uh, and Prabhupada explains this as well is Ridrog. Ridrog means uh, lust within our heart. The desire to enjoy separately from Krishna. That is our greatest enemy. Prabhupada said that is public enemy number one, is the lust. So how does that material disease get removed? Cheto Dapana Marjanam, Lord Chaitanya says, by chanting the holy name of Krishna. When you chant the holy name of Krishna, right? Your material disease will be cleansed from the consciousness. And you can realize your eternal relationship with Krishna once again. Now, Prabhupada explains near the bottom of page 69, there are three stages in chanting the holy name of the Lord. The offensive stage, the stage of lessening offenses, and the pure stage. These three stages are spoken about in the Harinam Chintamani. In Sanskrit, we call them Namaparad, Namapas, and Shuddhanam. Namaparad means we are committing offenses whilst chanting. If you chant the holy name of Krishna, but you are committing the ten offenses while chanting, any one of the ten offenses or several of them, It'll be very hard for you to advance in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, we should uh, uh, be very careful uh, offenseless chanting of the holy name of Krishna. Then we can come to the second stage of chanting, which is called Namabhas. Abhas means shadow, dim light. Just like when the sun is rising in the morning at dawn, dim light, you know, the, 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 the light has not come up yet. The light is still dim, right? That is a bus, shadowy. You, you realize the sun is there. You realize the light is there. Krishna suya samamaya haya andaka. Krishna is like the sun. He is like light. So when the sun comes up, uh, the, light, the darkness dissipates. So Namabhas means to chant so that the ignorance and the offenses and the material attachments begin to dissipate, become cleansed 
from our consciousness. And then the third stage of chanting is what we are aiming for. It is called Shuddhanam. Shuddhanam means pure chanting. Pure chanting means we chant the holy name of the Lord in ecstasy, with attachment to Krishna, with love for Krishna, with emotion. Uh, so that is what we're aiming for, to cultivate ruchi, or attachment, nama ruchi, in our chanting, so that we can get to the platform of pure chanting. Uh, the top of page 70, Prabhupada says, the conclusion is that in order to get freed from the material disease, one must take to the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. The Krishna consciousness movement is especially meant for creating an atmosphere in which people can take to the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. So we have to create that atmosphere where people want to chant, where they're enthusiastic to chant. That is what devotees are aiming for, to create a atmosphere uh, where people will come and they will feel enthusiastic to chant the holy name of Krishna. Now Prabhupada gives a breakdown of the, uh, the different levels of chanting from Shraddha to Prema, from the different levels of advancement in Krishna consciousness. Shraddha means faith, all the way up until Prema Bhakti, which means love for Krishna. So the more we purify our chanting, we will rise up higher and higher through the different levels of chanting the holy name of Krishna. We will rise to Shuddhana, pure chanting the holy name. Uh, Prabhupada says, near the, the bottom of page 70, if one is sincere, he is initiated, and this stage is called Bhajana Kriya. By Bhajana Kriya, one attains freedom from all the contamination of materialistic life. So we want to get over our attachment to materialistic life. The most effective way to do this is to chant the holy name without offense. Attentive chanting. Uh, on page 71, halfway down, Prabhupada says, At such a time, one can understand who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, who the Supreme Personality of Godhead is and what is Maya is. So the more advanced we become in our chanting, uh, we will understand our eternal relationship with Krishna and we will see Maya or the material energy simply as uh, his external energy. Hmm. Okay, so uh, of the ten offenses, uh, the offense of being inattentive while chanting Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, this is the cause of all of the other offenses. So, while chanting the holy name of Krishna, we need to learn to avoid uh, inattentive chanting. In other words, we have to learn to be at the name of Krishna, while chanting the holy name of Krishna. Our advancement will be very rapid, Krishna consciousness. So we'll stop here. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Anything we discussed tonight? Two very important verses which we discussed. Verses 6 and 7. Next week we will go through verses 8 and 9. So uh, that can be your homework. And uh, if you have anything that you need to discuss during the week, questions or anything uh, about the book, then please contact me. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you for coming.